Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kevin. I am an intern of OC Habitats, and I'll be hosting our presentation in happy hour today. And joining us for this presentation is our guest speaker, Christina Robinson. She's kind of a superstar in the environmental world. She's the education coordinator at OC Coast Keeper, as well as the tide pool educator for Laguna Ocean Foundation. And she even started her own foundation of Plastic Me Not. And she's also volunteering at many different organizations. She's working at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium doing their whale watch program. She's doing the Southern California Sea Turtle Monitoring Project with the Aquarium of the Pacific. And she's volunteering at the NOAA Fisheries West Coast Region and as well with us at OC Habitats with our monitoring projects. So without further ado, here's Christina Robinson here to talk about microplastics and pollutions. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you for having me today. So without further ado, we will start talking some trash. So we originally created plastic uh, to be an end-all solution in the early 1900s. It's so durable, we're able to add a lot of different types of chemicals to get those different types of plastic properties, right? So we can have plastic that is hard and brittle or soft and flexible. We know that plastic is so durable, um, you know, it <laughs> almost lasts forever, we can reuse it, but unfortunately it was just so cost-effective um, and so affordable to be producing new plastic. It's really become this disposable item that it is today. So we really started using, uh, making a lot of it around World War II. So since the 1950s, we've created 8.3 billion tons of plastic with only 9% of that being recycled. And we'll talk more about why that number is so low a little bit later. But first, it's difficult to even imagine uh, that much plastic, right? It's hard to visualize even a pound of plastic because it's so lightweight. So I have that Eiffel Tower there for you um, as a visual. Um, 8.3 billion tons of plastic would be equivalent in weight to over 800,000 Eiffel Towers or also uh, a million African elephants. So we've produced quite a bit of this. In the mid 1970s, our global plastic consumption was around four and a half pounds per person per year and has increased to around 95 pounds per person per year today and is still increasing. According to National Geographic, if we continue uh, consuming plastic at this rate, we'll have about 12 billion metric tons in our landfills by 2050 since so little of it is being recycled. We're still currently producing over 300 million tons of plastic every year, half of which is for single use plastic. So these are all those plastic items that are really uh, meant to just have that one purpose. We're oftentimes only using them for a very short amount of time. So things like single use plastic straws, utensils, and a lot of our food packaging and containers. Unfortunately, most of the single use plastic uh, isn't even recyclable. So it's really contributing to that recycling issue we have around plastic. Uh, it's important to note that plastic is a byproduct of oil and natural gas and also requires other resources to make during production. So if we think about one single use plastic water bottle, it can actually take up to six times the amount of water in that one water bottle plus a quarter cup of oil to produce just the one plastic water bottle. Um, and right now it's not really effective in even recycling those little bottle caps, right? We're not really able to do that in most places. We're still seeing that, you know, more than 8 million tons of plastic are finding its way into our ocean every year. And we'll talk about how it gets there a little bit later as well. With all this plastic entering our marine environment, we're seeing that one in three species of marine mammals are being found entangled in marine litter. Oftentimes, is this are things called uh, ghost fishing gear or derelict fishing gear. So these are all of those nets, pots, and traps that are uh, discarded and irresponsibly managed by fisheries. We're also seeing that over 90% of seabirds are being found with plastic pieces in their stomach. And this is because all of this plastic waste is ending up in the environment and the habitats that they're foraging. But also remember I mentioned how we add different types of chemicals to make different types of plastic. Uh, those chemicals can also change the weight and density of plastic, but also can create a, a scent or a smell. So some of this plastic actually smells like the type of food that these birds are hunting for. 
of all of the trash that's floating in the ocean, 90% of that is plastic. It's also really important to note that plastic is not biodegradable the way that we use that word today. When we think of something that's biodegradable, a great example would be leaf litter. So a leaf that's falling down to the ground, it's gonna rot, decompose, uh, break down back into organic material and nutrients that nature can then reuse and recycle. Um, plastic's never gonna do that since it's made from oil and chemicals, right? It's just gonna break down into tinier, tinier pieces. And we'll learn more about that in a little bit. With all this plastic that's ending up in the ocean, we're seeing our North Pacific fish are ingesting tons and tons of this every year and that our Great Pacific garbage patch is now starting to outnumber our marine life six pieces of trash for every one organism. Here in this picture, we're actually looking at the Wintersburg Channel at the Bolsa Chica wetlands. Um, so we are looking directly at the Wintersburg Channel, which serves the cities of Westminster, Fountain Valley, and Garden Grove as part of our storm drain system for any time it rains. This helps prevent flooding. Um, but you can see this channel is then connected to the Bolsa Chica wetlands, um, then goes to Huntington Harbor, and that water then goes to Bolsa Chica State Beach and Sunset Beach. Here we have this yellow trash boom. And so it's helpful in preventing a lot of this trash from entering um, the rest of the body of water. But you can see that it's not 100% effective. We have that plastic bag on the other side. It's also important to note that this is only going to be preventing that uh, floating trash from entering the wetlands which is good, we want that because we do want, you know, we have animals moving underneath here. So we kind of need a, a surface protector like what we have here. And here's a nice graphic kind of showcasing those different types of plastic materials and whether they float or sink based on those different chemicals that are used during production. I've always been surprised, uh, you know, that, oops, that plastic bags float, but yet plastic film will sink. So it just depends on what chemicals are used during production. So here is some more trash that I've seen at the wetlands, which makes me super sad. It's a sensitive habitat really critical for a lot of our wildlife. Here's trash that I've picked up in my neighborhood. Um, I live in Fountain Valley, so I feel very responsible for that trash that ends up at Bolsa Chica wetlands. Um, this is trash that I pick up um, when I go surfing. I always try to pick up at least five pieces of plastic when I walk back to my car and encourage my friends to do the same. Uh, so much so that a lot of them will do that when we're not even surfing together now, but I encourage any everybody to pick up you know five pieces of trash whenever they can do so outside safely. Here we have some trash that I've pulled from the tide pools, which really bums me out because a lot of those organisms um, aren't really leaving the tide pools, they're staying there, so they're having to live in this pollution. Here we have the top 10 types of trash found at beach cleanups. So this comes from a lot of different organizations that do cleanups like Coast Keeper. We can send this data to the Ocean Conservancy to kind of see what types of trash we're seeing and that's ending up at our beach. So it's interesting to note is that all 10 of these items are made of plastic, even our cigarette butts, those little filters are lined with plastic. Um, it's also great to note that these are all examples of single use plastic items. Up until 2019, cigarette butts ranked number one for years and years up until food wrappers um, took that number one spot. This has really just been intensified with the pandemic since we're having to order more takeout, uh, are unable to use reusables as often, and a lot of restaurants are having to use more single-use plastics for things like condiments that they normally wouldn't have. Uh, one thing I'm trying to do to help mitigate and reduce that is anytime I'm ordering you know, takeout, trying to remember to say, hey, no, thank you. I don't need that straw. I don't need utensils. I have some at home. And then because of COVID restrictions right now, anytime they hand us our food, um, we're unable to give that back to them. So I'm really trying hard to remember like, hey, just wanted to double check that there's no plastic in here. I'm trying to reduce um, before I receive my food. I definitely don't remember every time, but practice makes perfect. Another type of litter we're seeing from this pandemic is PPE litter. So there's now a lot of face masks and gloves um, that are everywhere, unfortunately. So if you're using face masks that are, um, you know, single use or you're disposing of those afterwards, please cut those ear straps uh, to help prevent wildlife entanglement. Even if we're properly throwing those masks away, we're never personally, you know, following our trash to its final destination. At my apartment complex, when our dumpsters get serviced, uh, oftentimes I see a lot of leftover trash that doesn't really get taken care of. So easy things we can do to help prevent more entanglement. 
Earlier, I mentioned how 8 million tons of trash is ending up in our ocean, um, 8 million tons of plastic specifically. So how is it getting there, right? This is just a reminder that we all live in a watershed wherever we live um, around the planet. Even if we're in a desert or not close to an ocean, we all live in a watershed. A watershed is going to be that area of land that just drains all that water and sediments back down to the ocean via gravity. And so in our area, we have a storm drain system to help prevent flooding. And so while it's very, you know, efficient in preventing flooding, unfortunately, this is how 80% of our trash is transported from our neighborhoods and places up the watershed. Uh, they then make it all the way back to the beach because water is so heavy. This picture here is actually from uh, Seal Beach, which is notorious for getting a lot, a lot of trash um, after it rains. We're seeing that of all the beach litter worldwide, 73% of that is plastic as well, and that 90% of plastic in the ocean is coming from these 10 rivers in Asia and Africa. I think sometimes people hear that last statistic and they think, well, who cares? Not my trash, not my problem, or that's on the other side of the world. So you know, why should I care? Uh, but it's really important to note that the United States actually makes the most waste uh, worldwide of any country. So we should be actively trying to reduce that waste production um, and managing that waste better and being more responsible about it. We used to actually send a lot of our plastics um, and recycling materials to China up until 2018. Since then, we've been sending a lot of these materials uh, to countries in Asia and Africa, oftentimes which they don't even have the proper infrastructure to handle those materials. So some of that trash could very well be ours. Um, and just like we all live in a watershed, all that water is connected, right? Um, I know we're taught that we have five oceans. It's five ocean names. It's really one big ocean because all of that water in the ocean is eventually going to circumnavigate the planet. Um, really just connecting us all. And we all depend on the ocean as an important resource for so many things. So again, here's an example uh, to show you how that storm drain system works. This is a neighborhood in Santa Ana. So any of this trash or litter is gonna get, you know, moved into a catch basin, whether it rains, um, when it's windy, or when we are using too much water outdoors, right? And we have that urban runoff, so we can um, you know, reduce our overwatering to help prevent this too. But anything that goes in those catch basins or gutters is gonna end up in an underground storm drain or an above ground storm channel, ending at the ocean and oftentimes in our wildlife. While beach cleanups are really uh, helpful as a last ditch effort to prevent marine debris, doing neighborhood cleanups is so helpful in preventing that trash from getting there in the first place, right? It's really hard to pick up a lot of this trash and plastic and styrofoam once it's broken up into a million pieces. And so I'm sure some of you have heard of our Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's good to note it's actually two distinct patches that are bound together by the North Pacific uh, Subtropical Gyre. We're seeing that more than half of this trash is coming from land-based activities in North America and Asia compared to 20% coming from water-based activities. It's also important to note that 70% of this marine debris is actually sinking to the bottom. So we're only seeing uh, what's floating. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as a trash island. It's much more of a plastic soup as we can see this scuba diver here uh, moving through it. It's also important to note that unfortunately we don't have just one uh, garbage patch. We have one in every ocean. Uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is just the largest so it's the most well known. And here you can see the two distinct patches and how they are bound together. Earlier I mentioned how microplastics are um, or sorry, how plastic cannot break down into organic matter and nutrients, right? It's just going to break down into these microplastics. And so these microplastics are these tiny little pieces of plastic, almost like a sesame seed size or a single grain of rice, um, technically less than five millimeters long, and some are even smaller than that, known as nanoplastics. A huge source of our microplastics um, are going to be microfibers. So microfibers are these tiny little plastic fibers in our synthetic clothing materials. So things that are really comfortable, really affordable, like spandex and polyester. But you can see that the diameter of these fibers is a lot skinnier than our organic clothing material. 
And so what happens is when we are washing our clothes, that spin cycle agitates these fibers, they start to shed and all the water that we use indoors is part of our sewer system. So anytime we're doing the laundry, cooking, taking a shower, or using the bathroom, all that water is part of that sewer system gets sent to a wastewater treatment facility where they filter and treat that water before it goes into the ocean. But unfortunately right now, uh, we're unable to remove these microfibers and part of that process. Here you can see some samples I actually collected of microplastics under the microscope a few years ago when I was looking at coastal benthic samples. So I was just looking at the ocean sediment, trying to sort out fish eggs and different invertebrates, but I kept seeing these little plastic pieces and fibers and started keeping them because that was, this was really my first exposure of realizing uh, how ubiquitous these, this microplastic is and this plastic pollution problem is. So again, here's some organic material. You can see that blue microfiber running through it and another black microfiber here. Where are these microplastics being found? Unfortunately, everywhere, every body of water, our deepest ocean trenches, ice core samples, um, air pollution, and even our soil, as well as things like packaged tea, table salt, tap water, and bottled water. Here we have another example of a primary source of microplastics, which is nurdles. So nurdles is how we uh, ship plastic for production. So these little tiny pellets you can see often look just like fish eggs. And oftentimes there's spills during manufacturing and then they end up everywhere. Here's a graphic showing a study that was looking at different water bottle company brands, the manufacturer and then the country tested looking for microplastics, right? And I share this with you because I want everyone to know um, just because there's also microplastics in some tap water, we don't want to be buying um, this bottled water if we don't have to. Um, the average amount of microplastics they found was 325 pieces um, in these water bottles. And so especially here in North and Central Orange County, we have really safe, clean tap water due to our unique partnership with the Sanitation and Water District utilizing our uh, aquifer, our underground water storage. And so again, we have very clean, safe tap water here um, that we should appreciate because we don't have that everywhere in this country, not even in California. So maybe you don't like the taste of your tap water and you can just use any type of a portal charcoal filter um, to change that flavor. So I have like a portable Brita filter and then I can just use tap water and, um, you know, reusable water bottles. These bottle water companies are pretty much just bottling tap water anyway. Um, and it's important to note that our tap water is much more regulated than these bottled water companies. And so once they bottle that tap water, they just add their own unique blend of minerals. Um, and that's what gives it that unique flavor, right? That's why Dasani tastes different than Aquafina, but you can buy your own minerals uh, as well, right? If you like that flavor. If we're continuously buying this bottled water, it's just increasing that consumption consumer demand. It's, you know, keeping the cycle going, adding to this plastic pollution problem and microplastics and just keeping that plastic tap on. So we really want to avoid that as much as possible if we can. If I'm going to an area and I don't know the quality of their tap water, instead of buying a whole flat of, you know, 30 plastic water bottles, um, I'll just buy like a two liter jug. And that way, at least it's reducing that plastic, uh, you know, consumption. And that's what I do when I'm camping or, you know, anything where I have to be bringing in my own water. Some other sources of primary microplastic sources are going to be microbeads. So these little polyethylene plastic beads that used to be in some of our personal care products, things like face wash, soap, and even toothpaste. The Obama administration passed a law in 2015 banning this in production, but we don't really know how well that's uh, being enforced. So it's always good to be a responsible consumer, read those ingredients before we buy anything. Besides microfibers and nurdles, other primary sources that I thought were really interesting are things like tire dust, city dust, and also a lot of the paint that we use in our marine industry. Our secondary sources will be any type of plastic pollution that's left as litter in the environment. It's gonna break down into microplastics microplastics through photo degradation. So you can see here that that sunlight is going to be making these plastic pieces uh, really dry, really brittle. So they're going to photo fragment. Sometimes when I'm doing beach cleanups, I'll see straws that are starting to like shred or when I pick them up, they're so brittle, they just start to crumble. And so that is this process happening. 
mentioned earlier, some wildlife, you know, gets entangled um, and also ingest some of this plastic pollution. So a big issue with wildlife eating plastic is that oftentimes they feel full from all the trash, but they're not getting any nutrients. So they become malnourished and this oftentimes leads to starvation. When they get entangled, this can also lead to uh, drowning, especially for our marine mammals um, and as well as turtles and, you know, even sharks and things that aren't breathing air, they can kind of panic. Um, and unfortunately, that's what happens. There's currently still a lot of research looking at the chemical consequences from those chemicals that are added and how this can change and impact uh, animal behavior. We're seeing at least 700 marine species being impacted by plastic pollution alone. So this is anything from our tiny little zooplankton all the way to our larger megafauna like whale sharks and dolphins. But it's really important to note that this plastic pollution is not only harming our marine life, this is also impacting our wildlife and terrestrial ecosystems everywhere too. Unfortunately, a study came out last year that showed that 88% of these animals that are either ingesting or being found entangled in plastic are already on our um, endangered and threatened species list in the United States. So these are really vulnerable populations that are then getting um, hit with this plastic pollution as well. Here we have a sperm whale that was found with 80 pounds of plastic in its stomach in 2019 off the coast of the Philippines. Uh, sperm whales are really deep diving marine mammals, so they use echolocation to hunt for squid, but unfortunately, you know, found all this plastic and trash instead. This is another sperm whale found uh, within the same month of 2019 off the coast of Italy and unfortunately was also pregnant and found with 50 pounds of plastic in her stomach. So with all this information about plastic pollution and microplastics, um, it kind of begs the questions, how, how are we being impacted, right? We already see that a lot of these species found with microplastics are the same species that people are consuming. We're seeing um, a study done where laboratory mice were fed microplastics and how those microplastics were accumulating in different body organs. And we already know that some of the chemicals used in plastic production are known endocrine disruptors um, or impact our hormone system. System, right, which is super important for lots of body functions our whole life. Some of those chemicals are phthalates and BPA or BPA replacements. So oftentimes I see this now at stores, um, especially for like reusable plastic materials like Tupperware or bottle, uh, water bottles, where it will say BPA free. Uh, all that means is that last A molecule was replaced with either S or F. So it's BPS or BPF instead of BPA. But chemically, this functions exactly the same um, as BPA as an endocrine disruptor, if not worse. Uh, so please know that when you say BPA free, it's it still has those chemicals. We also know that when plastic is photodegrading is, you know, when it's litter in the environment, and it's breaking down, it also acts as a vector. So it's able to absorb a lot of contaminants and pollutants and bacteria that are just in the environment. And we just need to, you know, we need a lot more research to see how these different chemicals and contaminants are moving through the food web with bioaccumulation and biomagnification. We also had a study came out that came out in 2019 estimating that everybody is eating about a credit card size worth in weight of microplastics every week. And so the good news is that it sounds like we're kind of just expelling and excreting those tiny little plastic pieces. They're not staying in our system, but we really need long-term research to see what's going on with those chemicals, right? Um, is there any interaction with, while those plastic pieces are passing through us? We really need that long-term research to see how these tiny exposures uh, over time add up and if they're impacting our health. So this is known as acute toxicology or toxicity. The good news is a lot of these studies have just started even locally um, at Costa Mesa at Squirp or the Southern California Water Research uh, Coastal Project. And so, um, you know, while these studies are being done, I like to err on the side of caution. So I'm really trying to reduce my plastic consumption and contact as much as possible. Here we have the crazy no plastic lady again, just highlighting how much plastic we're surrounded by, how much has been um, items used in the kitchen, things targeting little kids and babies, right? So definitely try not to um, 
And I highly recommend not heating up any food in plastic Tupperware. If you're using that for storage, please you know, heat it up in a regular um, bowl or plate. But this is a reminder too that we didn't always have plastic. As a society, we can definitely go back to basics and reduce a lot of this. And so before we continue and kind of move from uh, the horrors of plastic pollution and talk about solutions, I'd be happy to ask any questions if we have any. We did have one about the uh, minerals you use to kind of reduce the fibers and plastics in your water uh, and wondering where you could get them uh, besides Whole Foods. Oh, okay. So if you wanted to add minerals to your water, um, I'm not sure exactly all the different brands and things. Um, I can look into that though and get back to you. I have some information towards the end of this presentation though for different water filters that you can use to filter out microplastics. Um, so that will be covered shortly. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Another question, um, just kind of in general. Let's say for friends or family who aren't too uh, educated on plastic pollution, what would be a very simple or small change that we could convince them to make that would have a pretty large impact or lasting impact moving forward? That is a great question. This is something I struggle with personally as well. Um, sorry, my dog. <laughs> Um, so I would say the greatest thing to do is changing that mindset, uh, with reduce, reuse, recycle, which we'll be talking about as well. But if we can just get everybody to think about how they can reduce their plastic usage every day, I think that would have uh, significant impacts and it's not something where it's like impossible, right? It's not using zero plastic. It's just reducing, um, and being more conscious about that as consumers, when we're buying, what we're using in our daily lives. So that would be my answer for that. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So again, we need more research. We need more data, right? Uh, we currently don't even have a standardization for microplastic research and how to compare that with other studies that are happening around the world. But we do have some really amazing uh, human innovation and technologies that have taken place recently. So we have an actual sustainable biodegradable plastic created by the researcher Sandra Pasco Ortiz from Mexico, where she created um, a plastic where she's just juicing the blades of this cactus species. So the plant stays alive, super sustainable. She then adds uh, different non-toxic chemicals to create a hard, brittle plastic or something that is soft and flexible. It only takes about 11 days and it can actually biodegrade um, under a month, which is incredible. My hopes are that we can scale this uh, for food production and it could, you know, help replace a lot of that food packaging. We also have 4Ocean, which is a company where they pick up one pound of trash for every bracelet um, purchased and the Ocean Cleanup Project that was created by Boy on Slot, where he's actually utilizing the ocean currents to bring the trash to him and his contraption and then is able to bring that back to land um, and use some of that reclaimed ocean plastic for other items. We then have the Seabin project by these two Australian surfers where they're kind of using the same idea. Um, but instead of uh, an ocean current, it's actually happening in harbors. They have like a large metal drum that bobs with the um, current up and down and then trash can kind of filter in through it. And I have some pictures here in a second I'll show you. We also have um, microplastic research that you can do at home known as baby legs. We actually had some students uh, before the pandemic make their own to test for microplastics in Upper Newport Bay. So it only costs them you know, $10 um, for these tights that they bought from Target. They then reuse some soda liters um, and had two of them to look at these two different locations in Upper Newport Bay. And so after they'd filter that water through, they'd flip the tights over, remove any large organic material, and then look at all of that water under the microscope. So you can see these two microfibers here and some more microfibers um, and plastic pieces here as well. They definitely saw plastic um, in every sample from both locations. And here is that four ocean, uh, one of their boats that they have taking that surface water, skimming it in the back. Uh, and then they're actually able to sort out any organic material from what's plastic and trash. 
This is Boyan Slot's ocean cleanup project. So again, using the ocean's currents to bring trash in here, they can then um, attach this to the boat, bring it back to land. And he was only 17 years old when he thought of this, uh, which is just truly amazing. And you know, they weren't even successful with their first haul. They had to go back to the drawing board, um, figure some things out, and then had their first successful haul in the fall of 2019. Um, you know. It just goes to show you, you're never too young to help be part of the solution. You can help be part of the solution at any age. And recently, we also just learned about this bacteria species um, that's actually able to eat PET plastic. And so our hopes are that this is something, um, you know, that can really help make recycling certain types of plastic more efficient, help create a market. We also have Fion Fiera, who won the Google Science Fair Award in 2019 at just 18 years old. He figured out a way to remove microplastics from water using a magnetite powder. Um, he created this ferrofluid that the microplastics bind to, and then he's able to just use a little magnetic rod uh, to remove them all, which is really amazing. And so um, here's an example of that. And then I will quickly show you some of the highlights here. So this was kind of his plastic, microplastic suspension here. You can see he's mixing it up. He stirred it up and then he's going to be adding this magnetite powder solution. He then mixes all of that up. So it kind of becomes this conglomerate all together and then he's going to come back in with that magnetic rod and just remove it all which is really amazing he was 87 percent effective after a thousand tests and my hopes are that we can scale this technology for our wastewater uh, facilities to use to help remove those microfibers uh, from our sewage if you're wondering how you can help prevent uh, microfiber pollution, avoiding fast fashion, those, those uh, you know, synthetic clothing materials like polyester, acrylic, and nylon is really helpful. Also because fast fashion isn't very ethical with the people who make those clothing. Um, trying to you know, utilize more organic clothing materials like cotton, jeans, and hemp. Um, and shopping secondhand is a really great way to do that. Um, I shop secondhand, actually the shirt was from the thrift store. And um, even for for items, um, not just in my closet, but things at home, trying to get more glass Tupperware or different items. Um, shopping secondhand is uh, super helpful for a lot of ways, good for the planet and your wallet. But some other simple things you can do are just using um, colder water when you're washing your clothes in a more gentle spin cycle that will help kind of reduce that agitation and those microfibers from shedding as much, as well as washing things by hand, right? Maybe if it's just like some bathing suits or certain specific clothing items, like workout clothes. Um, if you wash those by hand, that's really going to help prevent that shedding as well. We also just want to make sure we're not washing our clothes um, with hard objects like shoes or backpacks or things because that just kind of agitates it more. We do have some portable and permanent options for your washing machine as well. So the Cora Ball and the Guppy Friend are two portable options. Um, the Cora Ball is kind of mimicking how our coral uh, reefs filter feed. Um, and then the Guppy Friend is a bag that you would put those clothing items into. And so they have uh, different retention rates, um, but they're both around like $35. The Cora Ball is um, using um, virgin plastic that would have else uh, been wasted. So they're actually trying to help remove that from the system and you make it for these Cora balls instead um, from Vermont. The Guppy Friend is made in Germany. And then we actually have the Lint, the Lint Lover filter, which is a permanent option. Um, if you own your washing machine, it's the most effective, um, helping retain 87% of these microfibers. Um, and I believe it's around like $120, $150. For tap water, if we're concerned about microplastics, we have clearly filtered and the tap water. Um, both examples of that have you know portable options like a Brita filter, but they also have items that can either connect directly to your sink or your refrigerator. My siblings um, live in Oregon, so they bought clearly filtered when I told them about microplastics being in tap water, uh, and they actually liked it so much. My mom liked it so much they just bought her one this past Christmas. 
When it comes to recycling, we definitely want to be recycling what we can um, and what's accepted locally. But when it comes to plastic recycling, there is definitely some complications and some issues around it. Um, a quick summary will be that our Unfortunately, we just don't have a federal standard when it comes to recycling, and so our infrastructure differs um, city per city. So it's really good to check locally with what items and what numbers your local facility can actually accept. Here are just some examples, one through seven. These are those little plastic resin codes, and so number seven is where all of those single-use plastic items fall under. So a good rule to remember is just that the higher the number, the less likely it is to being recycled. The lower the number, the more likely it is to being recycled. I have some websites listed here. So the OC Waste uh, and Recycling website will actually help you find um, your city and your a municipality that handles your waste and recycle. So you can call them to see what they actually accept. They also have the OC recycle guide. So you can, you know, ask like, hey, are bread ties recycled? What, you know, what items uh, do you actually take? And then TerraCycle is an international company uh, that has a lot of great recycling programs. And some of them are even free based on their partnerships. So they have different drop-off locations or mailing items um, where it's even, you know, free shipping for you as well based on those different partners partnerships. So OC Habitats has a great recycling video as well um, that you can all check out to learn how to recycle more uh, effectively. And I will say too that what I really try to do is just to avoid plastic um, when I can find that plastic alternative like um, metal can or a glass bottle. It only takes cans 45 to 60 days to be recycled into a brand new can versus plastic is never recycled that way. It's much more of a down cycling where it has to be, um, you know, shredded, melted. They have to add brand new plastic to it, which is keeping that plastic tap on. And it's usually never going to become another milk jug or water bottle. It's going to become insulation or filler. Anytime I do have to buy plastic, though, of course, we can't always avoid it. I'll just try to make sure that I'm looking for that number, uh, that resin code number one or two, because in Orange County, um, that's really all that we're actually recycling is number one and number two. And again, that's just because we have a lack of market. Remember earlier, I said that it is um, more, it's less expensive and cheaper for companies to produce new plastics. So that's what's happening. And so, of course, we have reduce, reuse, recycle. I'm sure you've all heard that time and time again, but it's just important to remember that these are in order of what's most helpful, right? So if we're reducing our plastic usage and our plastic consumption, that helps decrease that demand for new plastic, helps send that message to companies, um, you know, that we really don't want this single use plastic. Uh, we can reduce a lot of our plastic use by reusing a lot of items, right? Uh, something that we started doing was reusing all of our zip Ziploc bags. So we haven't bought any new Ziploc since 2018. We have the same 20. We just wash them and reuse them. Um, it's helping decrease that demand for new ones and has also helped our budget. And then of course, recycling. We do want to recycle those items like paper, cardboard, uh, cans, and glass. Uh, but we just learned the issues with, you know, plastic recycling and why it's so complicated and how we're really only recycling numbers one and number two. So of course, recycle what we can when we can, um, but what's accepted locally locally. Some new R's are refuse and repurpose. So refusing those single use plastics whenever we can really helps again, send that message, decrease the demand for new plastic and then repurposing items, right? Getting creative, finding ways that we can reuse things um, like this really <laughs> amazing patio furniture scent made from tires, right? Um, and you know that way we can help prevent these items from going to the landfill. Um, and also donating is a great thing we can do to also help items from ending at the landfill. I also want to mention greenwashing. This is super relevant right now, especially as we have this zero waste movement out here. Um, unfortunately, we also don't have any federal re regulation on product labeling or what packaging says on it. So companies can kind of say whatever they want. They can claim their product is eco-friendly without providing any actual evidence. So unfortunately, it falls on the consumer, you know, to be doing this research, but at least we know about it, right? We can uh, make sure Sure we're being conscious when we're buying things and really looking into it before just blindly buying. A good example is these earth rated uh, dog waste bags. They say earth friendly, they have green on it. 
the only thing that's earth friendly is this, uh, that cardboard packaging right here, right? That can be recycled, but these bags are 100% plastic. They're even scented. So now there's like more new chemicals in there versus this company Beyond Green has these actual biodegradable dog waste bags. You can see here, they even say they're natural um, compostable, but what's really important is they have four different certifications on here. All of these certifications have websites that provide a lot of great information on how and why this product was vetted um, and why it's actually eco-friendly. All the companies that are greenwashing use super vague language like natural and, you know, eco-friendly, where if you Google that, nothing's going to come up. There's no actual website. Um, Tube Austria is my favorite certification to look for, especially because they um, specifically make certifications for if it's an industrial compostable or at home compostable um, and then marine biodegradable right they're very strict so I I appreciate that if you're wondering what else you can do you can um, there's lots of ways just to get creative and reuse different items in our home so I really like yogurt but was feeling guilty about those single-use plastic yogurt jars I started to buy it in bulk uh, and then you know use the Tupperware I have reusing um, this relish jar to hold my yogurt adding my own um, you know types of jam and granola just to make my own little parfaits um, and so I recommend you know reusing as much as you can we've been reusing all of our pasta sauce jars um, as drinking glasses or for plant propagation, um, even like as Tupperware is a way to, for, to use for food storage. Um, and same with things like sour cream containers. I've been using those to like organize things in some of my drawers at home, um, also for plant propagation. There's just so many ways to get creative with a lot of these things. So I like to think of it as thinking of the environment over convenience, um, the convenience of plastic. We've learned about the consequences of that, right? There's also so many plastic alternatives and zero waste options out there. Uh, we have refill stores as well, where you can even bring reusables. You just pay for the weight of what you're buying. So that's really helpful for things um, like cleaning supplies, things in the kitchen, things in the bathroom. My favorite refill store is Eco Now. They have a location in uh, Costa Mesa as well as Anaheim. And so here's some examples here. Um, I also want to note that so some of these items, you know, don't feel pressure to like be buying new things to be eco friendly. Yes, there's to go containers, um, you know, for your utensils, but you can use your own utensils at home, put them in your own little bag or Ziploc. And now you've just made your own right don't feel pressured to have to buy new things. The most sustainable thing you can do is use what you already have. Um, and then when it's time that you need a new item, think of these things, you know, as as an investment, do I really need this or, you know, can I use something I already have at home instead? So just some more examples of things that I use in my bathroom um, and when I'm traveling, like, uh, and some of these things too, a lot of this is going to actually save you money in the long run, like the bamboo razor blade. Um, I bought that once. The little refill blades are so affordable and, you know, um, I think you can get like a pack of 50 for like $2 or $3 and then I'm not having to buy multiple plastic razor blades like every month, right? Um, I was really upset when I learned about microplastics being in tea. Um, and so a great way to combat that um, for packaged tea is buying loose leaf. Again, like this little bag's only a dollar. So here's just some different uh, loose leaf tea options to hold your tea. This is kind of my go-to travel set. Um, using this little HelloFresh vinegar container um, now for like a face toner. Um, again, a little jam jar to hold some of my ibuprofen and just different items. Um, I think something too that we forget about, right? We didn't always have plastic. A lot of these alternatives have existed um, like bar soap, right? And oftentimes that's cheaper than our plastic soap anyway. I mentioned uh, marine wildlife getting caught in ghost fishing gear. So if you or anyone you know consume seafood, you can use the Seafood Watch website uh, where you can actually type in what seafood you're craving and they'll let you know the status of the fishery, if it's sustainable or if you should avoid it, as well as offer an alternative if it's an unsustainable fishery that has a similar flavor and texture. If you're eating out, I highly recommend asking where that seafood came from and how it was caught. I used to do this when I used to eat seafood Oftentimes I found that, you know, servers didn't know, but it's good because it brings awareness, right? Now they have to ask. Now they know where it's coming from, how it was caught, and hopefully it sends that message too that their customers want sustainable seafood. 
again, advocating, um, writing letters, voting on bills that are coming out, um, especially right now, we have some for California specifically about single use um, plastics and restaurants um, and trying to really vote with our wallets, um, demanding that change, right? As consumers, we have that power to tell these companies and these um, industries that have the resources, have the money to make these changes that we want them. And educating, of course, how can we help solve this problem if you know people don't know about it? Um, I mentioned earlier that Orange County or that the United States produces the most waste in the world. It's about four and a half pounds, you know, per day per person. California is unfortunately um, the most waste producing state, and Orange County is the most waste producing county, almost triple the average. And so I think while that statistic, um, you know, is a little daunting um, and while I'm competitive and I like being number one, I don't want to be number one when it comes to waste production, but I think a lot of people are unaware, right? So we need to help spread this message, um, let people know that there's easy ways and things that they can do in their day-to-day -day life um, to help reduce that waste um, and, you know, change that mindset. And then we cannot be number one for that statistic. So so if you've learned anything from my presentation and can share that one thing with a family or friend that will help create this ripple effect of knowledge. Here's some more helpful websites. Uh, like Kevin mentioned earlier, I created Plastic Me Not as a website and social media presence just to help educate on this problem and the solutions that we have. Um, more ways to get involved with Orange County Coast Keeper. We have a lot of great programs. Um, right now we're unable to do our monthly beach cleanups, but you can visit our website here to see how you can do your own neighborhood cleanup. And so thank you so much for your time. Happy to answer any questions uh, that anybody has. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Christina. That was great. Um, everyone, uh, feel free to turn your cameras on. We can, you know, any questions you have, I'm sure Christina would be happy to answer them. Um, I know Gina had a question earlier about um, how to figure out the difference between which are actually biodegradable and not. Um, do you have those uh, those certifications by any chance you can maybe leave in the chat so people know what to look for or what the websites they can go to to figure out which products they could find? Let me drop that in the chat right now. So this is the certification company that I'm always looking for. I would say that my, my personal rule is that if there's no actual certification on something, um, then I, I assume that's greenwashing, right? If they don't have any type of a certification or labeling, um, then I'm not going to trust it. And then again, the two of Austria one is really my go-to because they're so strict and thorough. And I love that they have the difference of uh, industrial compostability versus at home compostability, right? Because most of our landfills, a lot of them don't have the right conditions for industrial composting anyway. So for me, I'm really looking for, is it at home compostable? Cause that means it'll compost in our backyard or whatever, our, you know, composting machine that we have. I'd also, like to say too that um, from what I've heard and from what I've seen so far in the research on any type of a bio-based or plant-based plastic, I would avoid that. Um, it's still leaving little plastic pieces um, on some tests that have been done. And then even when it's in the landfills that have those very specific conditions, uh, it releases a lot of methane. So it's also kind of causing even more problems uh, just from the beginning research of what's out there right now. Does that uh, help clarify everything for you, Gina? All right, perfect. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, Great. Uh, Jenny had a question too. Yes, um, uh, can, I think I took my mute off. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, so this was more of a, um, uh, a comment more than a question. And that was regarding, um, instead of using bottled water when people are traveling, that uh, when you mentioned camping, that, in, uh, that you can get these things called a life straw where you can just put the regular water. I mean, because the water that you're getting out of the tap wherever you go isn't like it's you know poisonous, but if you don't like it or you just feel like you want to be safe, that you can put the regular water from the tap in and you know just drink it like you know a, a regular out of a, like a bottle. Or if you needed a lot of water, 
Um, they have these gravity fed filter filters by um, Sawyer is the one that I have. And I use it, of course, when I'm backpacking, but you could use it even just in a hotel room or wherever. And then, you know, fill up the thing, it gravity fills, and then it has a, a container and then you could fill your, your uh, water bottle after that. So just to let people know that there are some really easy, super, super easy alternatives to buying that 32 pack of plastic uh, like you were, <laughs> that you were referring to. Yes. Thanks. Thank you so much for reminding me about that. I'm going to drop that in the chat too. I actually just got a Sawyer squeeze straw, like a, um, yeah. they have like their own little setup, um, this summer for camping. And then I don't have what you have, but I got, they have like a, like an inflatable like jug. So you could like fill that up if yes. you're your water source and then just use the straw. So yeah, I should. Exactly. Have exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of the, the MSR, Sawyer, Spree, Sawyer Squee, Squeeze Life uh, straw. There's a lot of, um, a lot of different companies are doing exactly the same thing. So not just for camping anymore. They're great for traveling as well. They pack well. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, exactly. It, it could be for traveling. And I think the, the little Sawyer Squeeze thing that I got, um, Maybe it was like $20 and it's good for like up to like a hundred thousand filters or something. Like it has a really long lifespan. Yeah. Um, not a lot of people are traveling right now, but I know my sister, you know, pre pandemic was traveling quite a bit to different foreign countries and she would talk about how expensive water was and they would always end up buying water. And so I was saying, you know, instead of buying plastic bottled water, you know, get one of these things. And uh, that way you don't have to worry about that anymore. I, I wish I had had it bef before when I was traveling. Yeah, yeah I know. I Save yourself a lot of money. <laughs> Very good point. Thank you for sharing that and reminding me. I have a question, Christina. You had mentioned about Orange County being one of the higher, like in proportion to other counties being one of, do we know the reason why? I mean, we are a small county, so that's, that's, that's really disconcerting to hear that. Yeah, I learned it from um, OC, OCC's um, Recycling Center and one of their webinars we did for Coastal Cleanup Day. Um, I, I think it has a lot to do, he mentioned, you know, we just have a lot of wealth disparity. So we have, you know, as a county as a whole, we're known as like being a pretty wealthy county, right? But um, so I think with that, it's that mindset of, oh, like I, you know, this thing's broken, I can buy a new one. Oh, that thing's done, I'll throw it away and I can buy a new one. I think that mentality is a huge um, contributing factor to that. But with that said, with that wealth disparity, we also have communities that are in the opposite um, situation, right? Where they're probably using uh, sustainable practices, maybe more out of necessity because they have to be reusing items. And so, I think I wish that that mentality was just across the board that we should be more sustainable and reusing things regardless of what our financial situation is. It's better for the planet, for us, for wildlife, for everything. Um, and so I think like, you know, something that we always tell our students when we're doing this, these presentations is to just not, not feel ashamed for shopping secondhand. If you have to thrift, if you're doing these practices out of necessity, um, these are, these are good practices to have, right? Everybody should be reusing things and being as sustainable as, pro, as, um, as possible um, and, you know, donating things to help prevent it going from the landfill. We know that most of our plastic is ending up there anyway. Um, and if we can prevent that in any way that we can, I think that's helpful. But yeah, I, was, I know I was very upset to learn that statistic. I don't know if anyone has another question, but I had a question, another question about when you were talking about, um, you know, buying at thrift stores and things like that. And we did a whole presentation on that last summer called Fast Fashion with Abby. And it was really interesting. And one, one of the things that came up in the discussion, and I just wanted to bring it up again, and because we have different people here, is um, we were encouraging, you know, people to go, you know, reuse clothes and things like that. But what in the other discussion, what came up was that people that really need those clothes, you know, that, the, that those thrift stores were originally intended for are actually not getting, you know, like their, their resources are actually being depleted because people that can afford to buy clothes at a store are starting to impact the thrift um, organizations. And I'm wondering, you know, how do we remedy that? How do we equal that out so that we're, you know, people that can afford to do something different don't take away from those that really have a, a true need? Uh, and that we're not taking those resources away from them. 
That's a really good point. Um, and I've seen some stuff about that too, kind of raising awareness for that. Um, I think that one thing that we can all do is just taking better care of our clothes, right? Like I still have some, you know, synthetic clothing material from a long time ago, like 10 years ago when I used to shop at fast fashion stores when I was younger and wasn't aware. Um, but if we're taking better care of our clothes and treating them kinder, maybe washing them less only when we need to, hang drying, um, doing these simple things, patching when we have holes or, you know, re-sewing on buttons instead of just throwing them away, I think that can be huge and helpful in itself. Doing things like, especially for those that are able to, right, and that have these resources, um, doing like time capsule wardrobes where you are specifically know what you're wearing for what type of season. Um, and so that way you don't feel like, oh, I need to get rid of all these clothes or like I need to buy more clothes. It's like you kind of have your set stuff. Um, I wish that was another mentality we could kind of change, right? Clothing used to be so, so expensive and people only used to have like very few items because it was like such a luxury thing. And now it's become like, oh, I'm just going to have like 80 million <laughs> types of clothes for every season and what's new for this season. Um, so I, I wish we could kind of get out of that mindset like, like, oh, it's now it's summer and now I need this new outfit, right? So kind of changing that mindset, um, being, yeah, taking better care of our clothing. And then if you can't afford it, like buying those better clothing materials, right? Buying jean, buying cotton, buying hemp, um, instead of then trying to find those items at a thrift store for those that really need to rely on that as a resource. Could I add some tips to that? Um, if you do specifically want to still thrift, I mean, um, if you could, if you can't afford the like sustainable fashion brands that are out there, the new ones, um, that's awesome. That'd be great too. That's a, another good option um, to leave those thrift stores that, you know, for people that really need them, that um, need more access, especially for uh, size inclusivity um, and also, you know, affordability. So we would also recommend um, shopping at the secondhand stores that are more like consignment stores. So those are, those can be more expensive. Um, and they're also like where you can sell back your clothes as well. Um, so it's a good way to, um, not then, uh, take away from items that would be at like the more affordable thrift stores. So that was just the, the tip that I wanted to add. Great tip. Great question. I also, um, I think Abby, might have mentioned this in when she did her presentation, but I know that another option is that if you're shopping at a certain thrift store, like a local thrift store, and you're so you're depleting that resource a little, if you then donate your clothes back to that thrift store, then you're keeping the cycle going and you're kind of replenishing that resource. So I think that was something that Abby mentioned, but I thought I would mention it again. Thank you for sharing that. That's a, yeah, I love that, right? If you're going to be buying something from this thrift store, like however many clothing items you buy, donate that many back. That would be wonderful. And then it's like saving the same space in your closet. <laughs> it's a good practice. And they, they tell you to do that anyway, right? When you buy something new, you should be get, getting rid of something. Um, well, they told you, I don't know if that's a good system anymore, because, you know, like you said, we need to just try to use what we have. One of the things that I have, was just enlightened to in the last couple months is that on, it's on Facebook, and I know some of the younger people aren't on Facebook, but um, this group called Buy Nothing, have you guys heard of that? So it's a Facebook group, and they're in all different communities. So my sister down in San Diego is the one that told me about it, and she says, oh, I'm part of this group, and it's um, Buy Nothing, meaning B-U-Y, Buy Nothing, and it's basically um, kind of, it's like thrifting on Facebook, but what you're doing is you, you throw out, hey, I've got something, you know, say, oh, I've got a bunch of reels of, of ribbon I'm not going to use anymore, and you're not sure, you know, if it's best to send it to a, you know, through a charity or whatever, because you're not sure what's going to happen to it. And it goes out to the community and then, you know, they kind of decide if they want it or not. And you leave it on your porch or wherever you decide to do it. And then you can also do a call out like, hey, I'm looking for, my sister said, they were looking for a mirror for their, um, their garage, a workout area. And they got one and she painted it. And anyway, it's kind of a neat system. I, I, some of, you know, I think sometimes I was kind of looking at some of them like, okay, they're, it's, it looks tedious sometimes, but if you have really something that you are looking for very specifically, that's another way where maybe you would not, you could, you could go that route. So then you're not impacting the thrift stores if you're looking for something very specific. 
that's a, a great resource and also similar to like the the next door app right where sometimes people are selling things but oftentimes it's like hey we're moving this is free um and it's within your community as well so that i'll definitely check out the facebook group too though but that's great to know i, I yeah, love it, it it was good and you have to apply and it, it's in your neighborhood so like i live in irvine so i'm in an irvine one and my sister's in san diego she's down in san diego so we know that and, and the reason that you want to be in a neighborhood is obviously if you're going to have people come pick it up off you don't want them to have to go you know cities and cities to get to you you want them to be you know close by so um, you can look it up if you're on Facebook, you just look up by nothing and then it'll ask you where you live and then they'll find the local, the closest one to you. That's so cool. Yeah. So that's kind of a, a new thing. Awesome. This was a great presentation. I, it really adds to many of the things that we've already been doing. And I, there was some, definitely some new stuff in there. And, it, you know, I know that you were hesitant to show some of the the not so pretty things with the animals, but I think it's important for people to see that there is a true impact and it's happening so regularly now. Um, and, and you were mentioning about how, you know, animals are eating the plastic and many times the plastic tastes like their food, whether it's because of what, how the plastic is made, but also I wanted to add, and I'm not sure if you did, maybe you did, so I might be repeating, but sometimes when that plastic is in the ocean, it's floating around and there's a lot of um, algaes and you know, micro animals that end up living on them, you know, bryzoans and stuff that attach to it. And so that also adds to what tastes like food to them. So, you know, they, they have, you know, things on it now that are growing on it that, you know, they trick those animals to thinking that it's food. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate that, that that's happening out there. And I wanted to ask you too, because we were talking, you were talking about the island I have read, and this is internet, right? Not trying to know what the truth is and what is not on some of these, these gyres that are out there. Um, some, I read somewhere that one of them was they could actually walk across the top of it. Now, is that a true statement? Have we heard that in any of those locations that it's actually that dense that you could potentially walk across parts of it? Um, I haven't heard that for any of the ocean gyres yet, but I'll have to look into that. I have heard though, for some of the landfill areas um, where it's most of our trash in some countries like in Asia and parts of Indonesia and stuff, right? Where they're getting all of our trash and they, they don't have any infrastructure for it. It, I, I just saw like a video where it's just like miles of trash that's like two stories high that people are like in the video, they're walking on top of it and they're pulling up, oh, this bag's from Pennsylvania. Oh, look, this is from Walmart. Oh, look, this is from like, you know, Colorado, like, you know, based on the packaging. So I have heard of that, but I, I'd ha I have to look into if there's any parts of any garbage patches in the ocean that are becoming that dense. I hope not. Yeah, I hope not too, but I feel like I, I was the one who found that article and it's been about a year probably. And I, of course, don't have it as a reference anymore, but I'm like, is that really, I mean, I mean, I hope it's not because obviously that's, that's a bad situation. I really hope it's not. That would, <laughs> that would also be, uh, I'd also really love to know how that could exist, like with all the currents and everything, right? Like moving right. the trash. So you'd have to be, you'd have to, it'd have to be in fairly shallow waters, I would think, because it'd have to yeah. go down to the bottom, right? Like, yeah, maybe like in a bay or something. Maybe. Yeah, I don't remember it saying that, but you know, again, the internet can be, it was just, it struck me. Like, really? You can walk across it? I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't take that chance, but <laughs> so I was just curious if you had heard anything about that. Not yet. I, now I'm going to have to go down a wormhole. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> Did you find it, Diana? You're on mute. Okay. I just can see your face. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't exist. Anybody else have any other questions for Christina? Now it is a little past 11. I'm, I'm not sure if we're happy to keep going or not, but I think we should probably wrap it up, but I would like to encourage our, um, you know, any of our friends that watch today that think this would be interesting to, we're going to be, um, you know, putting this on our website. We're going to send a copy of it to Christina so she can share it as well. Um, you know, pass this message along. This is all about education, right? So the more we can get that word out to people about um, what we're doing out there and how we can make some changes for the better. Um, so please let people know. We, we will, um, that the reason why we wanted you guys to put your names in there. So if anyone isn't already on our mailing list, if you want to put your name and your email into the chat, 
we'll add you to our mailing list. And um, but also know you can go to our website. We will post this on our website in our live stream area. So that should be done. Usually it takes about a week, so it'll probably be up in about a week. But if you'd like to get on our mailing list, you can put your name and your email in the chat, and we will add you. But um, yeah, so just spread the word. I think this was an excellent. I thank you so much, Christina, for coming. I'll let Kevin take over. Yeah, uh, I think it's an incredibly important topic that we're not really faced with, or you know, if you don't know about the situation, it's not anything you're ever going to think about. So you can get anybody out there to either watch the video or just share, you know, what you learned or what you know. It can make a small difference that adds up of each person. Um, and then if anybody here is not uh, aware of OC Habitats, we have a lot of great events we usually do. So we're doing restoration projects every week that are open to the public. Um, we do guided tide pool hikes and explorations. We'll be adding a uh, inland guided hike as well. And we have plenty of great articles and other spotlight videos that we've done on for our happy hours. So go on over to our website. It should be at ochabitats.org. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you so much for joining everybody. I uh, hope you have a wonderful Saturday. Let's all give a little nice virtual round of applause to uh, Christina for her time. <laughs> thank you for having me oh, and the you. wonderful questions and discussion too. Yeah, and thank you for being so active and motivated and everything that you do. It's impressive to be a part of so many organizations and even kind of start your own just because of what you've seen around the world. So thank you.